Let's get started, everyone. Good afternoon and welcome to this afternoon's 4 p.m. session on the Vision Stage. Hope you've all had a good day at HRC uh, and IFE. We're going to be sharing the findings for so far for 2023 from our future Food Trends Tracker. I'm Charles, co-founder of the Food People, and it's my great pleasure, as always, at these sessions to be joined on stage by MD of Good Sense Research, Kelly Dowson. Um, some of you will be aware of the Food People, we're a Future Trends and Foresight Agency. We're a team of people that have been united by a joint purpose for some 17 years to shift the future of food and drink by harnessing, a power of, harnessing the power of trends, something that brings us together as a group of people every single day. Kelly, can you tell us a bit about Good Sense and also introduce the tracker? Oh, is that okay? okay perfect. <laughs> um, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. So my name's Kelly. I work for a business called Good Sense Research. So we're a consumer research organization that specializes in understanding what consumers really think. And we focus on food and beverage um, as a sector, and we work across all channels. So we work across retail, manufacturing, and food service and it's the highlight of every year to work with Charles on the Future Food Tracker which we've been doing now for the last three years um, and the whole point of this program was to bed the great work that Charles does at the food people bed those trends in actual consumer understanding so we took the great work that the team have done at the food people we translated that into consumer friendly language and we track what consumers think and feel about that on a monthly basis um, so we started it three years ago we weren't quite anticipating the roller coaster of the last three years that we've had but it has made for some quite interesting findings in the tracker so how the tracker works on a monthly basis is we we have a almost 20,000 person panel at good sense research um, we speak to that panel monthly, um, ask them a series of questions. We take a sample of 400 as a minimum. Um, we adhere to all the market research society guidelines with regards to um, how often they take part in the, in the tracker. And we've got over 12,500 touch points over the last three years. So there's a, a heck of a lot of data in there. And our job today is to try and show you some of the really interesting things that we found in that tracker in the hope that you can use that as part of your strategy moving forward. And what we've, we've looked at today through an eating out of home lens only, so just to qualify that. So just to give you a sense of the general feel amongst the nation, it's a really sad reality that the state of mind is not in a good place right now of the nation. And it's no surprise really. And last year's word of the year was permacrisis for, for understandable reasons. We've bounced back from the brutality of lockdown in straight into war, cost of living crisis, unemployment, strikes, and empty supermarket shelves more recently. It's therefore totally unsurprising that over two thirds of us are finding it hard to look at the future with much, much positivity. In particular, the outlook on supermarket, the prices around supermarkets uh, is, is especially grim. And I think when we look at the overall psyche of consumers with regards to the cost of living um, crisis, 96% of people feel that food and drink contributes most to the intensity of that problem for them. And I think it's, it's, such an, it's often a daily transaction. People are handing over money for food, when in reality, energy crisis is probably a little more impactful on a monetary basis, but it's less tangible for consumers. So, the point being, it's, it's really highlighted to them that food and drink is, has a massive play in how much money they have at the end of each month. However, there is opportunity in that. Um, and I think it's one of the big things that we found is that people do want to go out. They do want to eat, eat and treat themselves. And it's against that backdrop that we're able to say it's never been more important to delight our diners. Especially with supermarket prices feeling so prohibitive at the moment, with the you know, record costs with energy bills, they have to find ways to make savings. And often, well, what we're seeing here is 64% of consumers are eating out less. And we're seeing that it's generally women and generally people aged between 35 and 44 that say they're eating out less. 
and obviously they're both massive groups that impact the um the sustainability of the food service economy and I think just to put into context from an, another piece of work that we've done, we see that 40% of people in the last month have skipped a meal um, to save money, which is, which is really quite alarming. But that does mean that eating out is returning to what it once was in terms of that real treat occasion. So there's definitely things that we can do to enhance that. And we'll talk more about that as we go through the presentation. But I think during COVID and lockdown, you know, we were confined to our own homes then the eat out to help out scheme came in we were going out all the time and i think people are now less likely to eat out because they're feeling lazy and they don't want to cook at home but it's much more linked to that treat so it's more important than ever to make that whole treat treat occasion really big for consumers um on the next slide here we can see that um that's think, mine sorry that's a wrong slide Apologies. So yeah. we'll we'll send you a copy no. of the ah oh, no, here no, we go, sorry. that's it. Um so a reduction in eating out has been married up with a variety of other cooking methods that are more thrifty and just general behaviours. So as you'll all be aware, air fryer sales are up massively. So people are thinking about less energy, they're thinking about how to make more use of leftovers. Um, and in supermarkets, we're seeing that people are compromising more on premium and brand and going more for a lower tier um, or an own label opportunity. So clearly, if we want to get people eating out more, we need to think about how to communicate the benefits. And it's always easy to say discount, but I think there's a bigger piece here around what good value looks like for customers. So they are looking for good value as opposed to cheaper. Um, so some of the examples that you will have seen are use our energy, not yours, um, trying to, to put offers on where you have a meal on the evening and have one to take home for the following day. Um, there's a really a cool place in Sheffield that's promotional slogan was imagine you could eat out for less than it would cost you to make yourself and no washing up. I think that's quite a nice emotive way to try and drive some of that footfall. And we've seen from wider work that we've done, there's been a real shift over the last six months. So when we look back to data from November, generally speaking, what we were seeing was there was a reduction in unplanned trips to eat out. You move into December, there's a no more lazy treats. January, it was strictly treat only. And then February, we're seeing people make more of a shift to, I'm going to go to McDonald's because I can feed my family and it's still going out and it still feels like a treat. So some of those lower entry point establishments are still managing to convey a real tree at a lower price point. And I think that's obviously reflected in the sales growth that we've seen on McDonald's and Greg's more recently. Um, Charles, what are you seeing happening? Uh, what I'm seeing is we're playing slide lottery at the moment. Um, they're not perhaps in the order that we thought they would be in. <laughs> and they're moving on of their own accord. So I'm gonna go back one. <laughs> Um, so thanks for that, Kelly. So we've heard about the forces and how they're impact, impacting consumers. So what about hospitality uh, operators and chefs? They're obviously having to adapt to these uh, forces uh, at the same time. Uh, so they're, they're very similar to the ones that we're all facing in our homes. Increased raw material price increases, um, uh, energy price increases in particular in affecting hospitality. But we're seeing operators do a number of different things. And we've taken this from the conversations that we're having with operators and chefs, and also from what we can see in evidence on menus as well. So we're seeing uh, operators reducing menu size complexity, um, certainly in the independent space, many more switching back to the traditional 333 model that you um, can see on the, the image on the top left-hand side there, three starters, three mains, three desserts, um, but providing the opportunity to accessorize and trade up with, uh, with additions. We've also seen many more outlets offering um, set menus, so a, a, a three course set or a five course set. James Cochran, really good example of that at 12.51. Um, have a look at what he's doing. Um, and he's been particularly inventive with his use of waste as well, actually. Um, we're also seeing uh, something that I spotted a, a few weeks ago and have since seen in evidence on a number of different um, set menus, and that's introducing sharing dishes to those set menus. 
So the dishes, perhaps the main core dishes, main course dishes put down, you might have had individual um, starters um, and uh, appetizers, but when the main course comes, it's actually a sharing dish. So it's slightly bigger than a single portion, but not as big as a double portion. So engineering uh, menu and uh, portion size there. Um, fixed seating times, also helpful um, to, um, to help manage kind of labor costs and those types of things. So in a number of places doing 6 p.m. seating, 8.30 p.m. Uh, sitting, everyone gets served at the same time, often by a blend of uh, front of house and, and kitchen, uh, kitchen teams as well. Also, a number of outlets really drive into local support to engage with um, local communities. The example there that you can see on the bottom left-hand side there is um, from uh, Mitch Tonks' Rockfish Chain, which is um, local, a local menu for local people, which I thought was really in uh, interesting. Lots of uh, elevated sides. So keeping main, uh, main course and core menu items uh, as lean as they possibly can, but offering the opportunity with it, with sides to um, to trade up to things that are more indulgent to accessorize. Also, also uh, outlets doing things like uh, flatbread menus, as an example, fairly cheap to produce, often made with unleavened dough, but you can then use uh, offer a fairly cost-effective. Uh, a base material of the uh, unleavened bread, you can then use more premium ingredients to create a perception um, of something that's a little bit more uh, added value. We're also seeing, unsurprisingly, more plants and vegetables on, the, uh, on menus. We'll talk a little bit more about that later on. Um, obviously, dialing into seasonality and also managing ingredient costs as well. And then we've got the retail side hustle. Um, so this is a way of allowing uh, diners to take the restaurant experience into their home, but also uh, attracting new customers with things like wines and sauces, charcuteries, uh, coffee, baked items, sandwiches, all driving alternative revenue streams. And the bottom um, right-hand side example is uh, Lulu's Deli, which is a spin out of Llewellyn's uh, modern European restaurant uh, in Herne Hill. And then on wine menus, looking at there's far more alternatives uh, coming through on wine menus, uh, more Eastern European uh, countries representative, wines from Czech Republic, Slovakia, Hungary, Croatia, Portugal, to name a few. Also seeing more half bottles on menus as well. They take less time to mature. So we're seeing uh, greater instances of um, half bottles on uh, wine menus. So just some of the ways that chefs are navigating their cost of cooking crisis. So now we've got a sense of where consumers are at more broadly, we're gonna move on to look at cuisines and in specifically where consumers are showing the most interest. And I think it's fair to say that most of us will be able to resonate with this hopefully. In times of stress, we're generally drawn to things that make us feel more comfortable that make us feel secure and safe. And it's why nostalgia generally thrives within a recession. We, tr we want to remember back to when times were easier, better, happier. Um, and though deep down, we probably know this wasn't necessarily the case, but this means that people are mo more focused on that indulgence, that comfort, as opposed to health, which we've seen in the past. So health is in consumers minds obviously more of a longer term investment so when times are hard people are less likely to focus on that you don't get that instant hit of oh i've eaten something healthy and i'm going to be much healthier tomorrow it's it's investing in yourself for decades to come so it's easier for people to they look for that small joy that comfort um and it's much more about the here and now and the cheap treats the pick-me-ups um, but it, we shouldn't lose sight of that and the health piece is here to stay and because of the cost of living crisis and many other factors the nation's more ill than it ever has been before we're seeing that one in five people have cancelled their gym membership 40 percent of people don't believe that they can eat a healthy diet on a budget and so there's some really shocking numbers around there Mel mental health issues are at an all-time high so that will be coming back and we need to be ready to deliver against that so on this slide here, you can see that it's the, the, the classic trilogy of British, Italian and American that are topping, topping the, the stakes. This is from January to now, so just 2023 alone. And it makes sense based on what we've just discussed, because these cuisines are more, they're full of comfort. 
they're flavours that evoke safe memories in a chaotic world. Um, obviously, we've had more co colder months, and so there is a seasonality play on that as well. Um, but we shouldn't ignore the fact that there is a really exciting second tier of cuisine coming through here. So the Spanish, the Greek, the modern British and the Mexican. Um, and the feedback that we've had from consumers on some of these more contemporary cuisines is that they're, they're more vibrant, stimulating, flavorful and healthy. So whilst these are communicating comfort really well, um, there is an important part, place for really communicating values like treat, excitement and health as mentioned. So coming on to look at what we've seen over the last three years, um, this is, you can see that the main cuisines that we've seen grow have been Mexican and Japanese, and then modern twists on popular cuisines such as British, Chinese and Indian. And with many people craving something that they cannot cook, cook at home when they're eating out, um, a way to elevate these dishes in terms of flavour excitement is to lead on a particular cuisine, but with a very modern twist. We have seen um, a drop on the right hand side there around awareness and interest, but this is generally because people are eating out less than they were three years ago. And I think what we've seen from some of the work we've done in home is that frozen and ambient sales in supermarkets are tending to be where the consumers are going. So they are looking for more of those freshness cues um, and excitement when they're going out. So really just building on what uh, Kelly was saying a few moments ago, it's, there's no real surprise that with everything going on in the world, there's a flight to comfort, a flight to nostalgic foods but I thought it was just worth just taking a moment to consider what those uh, what those are um, in times of stress and trauma we look to distract ourselves to displace ourselves with what's going on in the wider world we look to remove that stress and anxiety and distraction and escape is often achieved <laughs> I'm not sure why it's doing this <laughs> often achieved through um, comforting nostalgic uh, food and drink experience to create those real kind of moments of joy, I suppose. Uh, what constitutes comfort foods are unique to you and evolve as part of uh, social culture, your upbringing, your family, your generational influences, but are often a little bit higher in carbohydrate, fat or sugar. These foods release neurotransmitters that make us happy, physically stimulating our brain's reward system, giving us that dopamine hit that calming feel good but food is also highly emotional and nostalgia takes us to places to times to eras and with people uh, to which we associate happiness safety and sanctuary um, this is either a lived experience so something that you might have gone through yourself uh, a place or experience with someone else a childhood memory but also um, it can be a borrowed nostalgic experience so something that you're aware of because of wider social constructs, like we would know that toasting marshmallows over an open fire, there's something nostalgic about that, even if you've not experienced it firsthand because of how you see it represented in media and online and on social and in films. I do apologise for this. <laughs> it's moving around of its own accord. Um, aside from British, if there's one cuisine that embodies simple, satiating goodness, uh, it was right on the left-hand side of the chart there a few moments ago. It's the forever favourite um, uh, Italian. And there are many factors why Italian is so popular and especially relevant now. It's simplicity. Uh, its affordability in many cases, its associations with family and belonging, uh, but also accessibility and comfort, and as, of course the Stanley Tucci factor um, as well. And Italian is satisfying on so many physical and emotional levels. It's often a dish whose aromas or flavours uh, trigger waves of 
safety and nostalgia. It's uh, usually something that's warm and hearty uh, to get that dopamine going, as I talked about a few moments ago. And chefs and operators really see the versatility. Not only is Italian clearly mass appeal, but there's an opportunity to differentiate with Italian, uh, be new, be relevant. Italian can be so many different things. It can be craft, handmade pasta, can be the theater from Italian uh, fire cooking, fine dining or uh, house-made uh, salamis as an example. So it can span a single-minded uh, pasta-focused concept, somewhere like Notto would be a really good example of that, through to high-end Italian opulence, uh, somewhere like uh, Big Mama's Jacuzzi uh, recently opened would be a great example of that. It's very much the last frontier in terms of uh, delivery and takeaway, but that's been uh, uh, challenged by Jamie's Pasta Dreams Delivery Kitchen, which is now rolling out now across the UK and other parts of uh, Europe as well. And Pasta Evangelis uh, announcing that they're planning to open 800 delivery kitchens over the next couple of years. And diners are looking for big on experience. And if um, big on umami sits as part of big on experience, it comes, that comes naturally with the inherent Italian larder. The mushrooms, the salamis, the guincalo, um, the cheese, the anchovies, the tomatoes, and so on. And yet there's ever more to discover and reinterpret with the diversity of new and upcoming regions within Italian. So Emilia Romana, Piedmont, Liguria, um, Puglia and Umbria, to name a few that we're seeing increasingly being uh, name checked and referenced. And we're also seeing lots of humble classics with a twist. So it is things like the pork meatballs, but with India. Uh, it's pizza, but with white sauce or no sauce, or mo mozzarella um, with a scotch bonnet honey, something I saw literally just the other day. Chicken parmesan bites with a warm lasagna dip, perhaps. So Italian is a platform from which you can twist up, you can innovate, but from a base of comfort. But it is more than possible to innovate and be progressive in the context of needing to resonate at a comfort and nostalgic level. Three really, really lovely examples there. Uh, the Cavita, uh, from Cavita, the beef shin queso barilla. <laughs> um, deliciously slow cooked beef shin um, with an adobo sauce, crispy cheese, veal bone consomme for dipping there on the left hand side. Another example from Rowdy Rooster in New York. Um, that is, of course, a fried chicken sandwich, which is comforting um, and satiating itself. But in this form, twisted with Indian spice fried chicken, mint chutney, yogurt, as well as uh, chili cauliflower uh, and pakora pieces as well. And then the last example, cheese and onion cro croquettes from Nessa in uh, Soho. Clearly, cheese and onion being a, a very uh, clear and prominent uh, nostalgic flavor combination, but presented in a new and interesting um, uh, format there with a great, uh, a great plus uh, mustard. So if we think of all of the cuisines on the left uh, hand side, Kelly showed that are in growth, they all have that comfort theme about them. Yes, British um, and American, but also Indian and Chinese, again, a base for familiarity, but the ability to position those cuisines in a modern context. So really thinking about what com comfort means for you and your particular propositions, the dishes, the food formats, the ingredients, but also thinking about the right-hand side of that cuisine charts. How can you bring other influences in to twist up and make something that is perhaps ordinary and everyday, take that to the next level with uh, a different cuisine influence? So the next big area we looked at with the tracker was um, plant-based, but actually, um what we're finding is that meat is uh, by, by biting back with regards to um, eating out of home. So whilst plant-based eating has received a lot of attention and a big share of voice, almost a disproportionate share of voice, um, which has been enabled by some great innovations within the plant-based category and some really great products, it would be wrong of us to assume that the growth trajectory of that is the same as it was pre-pandemic. In fact, what our data is showing is that the proportion of people eating a purely plant-based diet is not much higher now than it was in 2020. When we speak to consumers, um, there's, there's a, I've tried to pull out the main reasons that they give. There's a big piece around value perception and linked to quality. So people aren't prepared to pay more for something that isn't as good as the real product. Um, and that, 
it's a different dynamic around spend when people are eating out of home. So if you're eating out in a recession, then it must be worth it. So they don't want to be compromising with a potentially an analog that's not quite on par with the real deal. Um, and personally, for me, if I see a meat option on the menu, on the menu for fifteen pounds versus plant based for thirteen, then the fifteen pound meat version feels much better value to me, and I'd be more likely to go with that. Um, the second is around health um, and consumers. We, we mentioned this at Speciality Fine Food Bar when we spoke there six months ago. Clean labels, you know, consumers are really picking up on that, and we've spent a decade educating the nation on how to not have processed foods with X, Y, and Z in, and you know they're realizing that with plant-based and when you look at some of the, the decks on analog it's it's big and that translates into eating out um so people are realizing that just because you say plant-based doesn't necessarily mean that it's always healthy it means highly processed for a lot of them and on that health cue there's definitely a piece around not getting the same nutrients especially around vitamin b12 and iron um, and additionally, love him or hate him, um, Jeremy Clarkson and Clarkson's Farm has had a massive impact and what we're seeing in a lot of the qualitative studies that we do currently is that consumers have got genuine sympathy now for farmers than they've ever had before and, and we're seeing that across dairy, across meat, you know, it's across all the categories where farmers have, have a part to play. And we've never seen it like that. And I think that, you know, that, that programme has been really great for, for British farming particularly. So on this slide here, you can see where the shifts are coming. So on the left, there's been a big resurgence in the proportion of pe people eating a predominantly meat-based diet when eating out. Um, it's actually this middle part here with the advanced flexitarians who are getting squeezed. Um, and, you know, with the, with the plant-based eaters, they are there. They're already in that camp. Um, they're not going to move back. But I think here, there's, it's not so much new news anymore for people. Um, and there may be a few in here that have dabbled, not quite where they wanted it to be. So they're looking for a step change in terms of quality um, before they're prepared to try again. But I think the point here is it's, it's really important to understand what is driving new consumers and the decisions that they make. Um, there's some quotes here from, from our panel around what they like when they eat plant-based dishes and it's clearly it's clear that they do play an important role in the food service sector um, and I like the analogy I use is I don't book a hotel because it's got a flat screen TV I expect it to have one and I don't really notice that it's got one but if it doesn't I'm like oh god everyone else has got one and I think that's what I like and like and plant-based too so when we first stood up here and spoke about this it was you must have plant-based because not everybody did and I think now people just expect it it's not that novel so you do need to have it um, when people talk to us about their favorite plant-based dishes they're generally describing cuisines and meals that are naturally plant-based it's not that common for people to speak fondly about meat replacements it's not to say that analogs can't work in food service and I think you know your best chefs people are going to trust them to produce some really great products so I think that there is opportunity for that you just need to think carefully about the execution um, when consumers are speaking to us most passionately about plant-based we do see it around cuisines like Asian and Middle Eastern um, which again are naturally um, plant vegetable or pulse based so just to demonstrate this further, this is for some um, social listening that we've done. So you can see this is um, noise around Veganuary. So from 2020, it's just dropped off. So it's indicating that it's just becoming more of a lifestyle piece, less of a, there's less interest around it, which I thought was, was really, really interesting. It still has its committed devotees but the growth amongst the casual participant is no longer at the trajectory that we saw between 2015 and 2020. So there's absolutely no doubt that plant-based eating is a permanent part of our dining landscape and chefs and operators have been proactively reducing the amount of meat in dishes and also swapping out some of those meat-centric dishes for plant-based alternatives as a way of a delivering against the need which we've talked about but also mitigating rapidly increasing raw material prices as well.
clearly meat substitutes play a part in this, um, and we, we don't expect to see that uh, go away. But when we're talking to chefs, they're also reverting to some of the inspiration platforms that they had some 10 years ago, which is actually adding value to the actual vegetables and plants themselves with a vegetable forward approach. And we've seen, we're seeing this now go uh, the complete circle. Uh, to manage, yes, ingredient uh, prices, but also as a great way to reflect uh, seasonality and value to, um, to the diner as well. A really good example of that, it's not on the screen, but a dish I had at Apricity a few weeks ago, uh, a roasted squash with baby leeks, cor coriander emulsion, and um, yellow split peas. And that was just adding value to the vegetable itself without any need uh, for any kind of meat replacement. But So we know that consumers are eating more plant-based meals at home, but, um, and we can see that chefs and operators have responded to that by putting plant-based dishes on menus. But for many of those conscious meat uh, reducers, they still enjoy meat when they eat out. Meat as a treat out of home is most definitely a thing. And again, in talking to, uh, to uh, chefs and uh, operators, they tell us that they're working super hard to provide diners with a, a less but better uh, meat choice and option when they're eating out, working with farmers and producers to develop a meat offering um, that really does resonate on many different levels. Emotionally, connecting them with the farmers so they're able to tell the story, um, but also uh, getting into and communicating uh, feeds and rearing uh, and uh, ethics, and also many more talking increasingly about regenerative farming practices. Uh, a couple of examples there on the screen there. Uh, bottom uh, left from Akub, that's a regenerative lamb shank with uh, braised malab, which is a fruity spice um, made from the seeds of the uh, St. Uh, Lucy's cherry. And then on the top right hand side there, a dish that I had actually, which is absolutely uh, delicious, koji marinated regenerative soy free pork, uh, pork line with, um, that was smoked, hay smoked and with pickled mustard seeds. And that was from a uh, native restaurant there. So clearly plant-based, absolutely uh, uh, a, key feature of the dining landscape going forward, but don't forget meat as a treat when eating out. So moving on to something slightly more controversial, and when we mention this to consumers, you can see their reaction on their face is definitely one of what, what? Um, so it definitely sparks a lot of emotion, but I think it's a really interesting space, um, and it could feed into quite a lot of different sweet spots for a consumer, especially with a lot of concern around the quality of some of the analogs out there and reducing carbon footprint. And don't get me wrong, okay, there's still a lot more people find it um, unappealing than appealing, but, and actually the proportion of people that find it very appealing hasn't shifted over three years. But I think where the really interesting piece sits is around this gradual decline in the most opposed to it. So we're seeing a big shift from 20% to 30. So in the non, no strong opinion camp, and that's a much better starting point for the industry to make gains when it ramps up the messaging around this. And I think, and it becomes more widely available, but I think it's a really interesting point that the public sentiment shifted in this way and it's not even actually available in the UK. So I think there's a lot of potential if the education piece is done right. So from the slides that Kelly's just talked through, um, we can absolutely see that the level of consumer acceptance is nudging very, very slightly uh, forward. And we've discussed the barriers to this in this forum and similar forums um, at, um, at other events, and they're around things like regulatory approval, uh, cost, scalability, uh, acceptance, which we've just touched on. I think the big one that I'd like to call out, and it's by no means saying that it's here, but the journey to commercialization and scalability is still on, is that in the US, the Food and Drug uh, Administration, the FDA, um, they evaluated the submission from a company called Upside Foods. You might have heard them in a previous guise called uh, Memphis Meats. They've concluded that they have no questions um, around their um, pre-market application, which basically means that they, they feel that it's safe um, for humans to eat. 
Um, what they'll now need to do is to work with the USDA to get the other approvals that are necessary to be able to take that to commercialization. And I think what many of the other uh, agencies in other parts of the world are doing are waiting to see, in essence, what happens uh, in the US, because that will then uh, give an indicative framework for regulatory approval going forward. <clears throat> We've seen um, Singapore continue their support, their trail-basing support for cell-based agriculture. Uh, they've approved the use of plant-based um, so animal-free uh, serums and, and growth media, which is a big step forward. Also seen some miniaturization of the technology, which means that um, cell-based meats may well be able to be uh, produced on smaller scales on, on farms and by farmers, which is really interesting. Lots of technological advancements, things like uh, improvements in bioreactor technology, meaning that you can get greater yields from uh, smaller machines. Reduction in cell feed costs, uh, to date, it's only ever been proven with farmer grade ingredients, which are super expensive. Uh, so that's recently been proved with uh, food grade uh, ingredients as well. And, and we've got governments around the world, uh, the Norwegians, the Japanese, very much supporting the advancement of this technology. And also the Dutch government that have committed some 60 million to a center for cellular agriculture. And they've also approved the sampling um, of cell-based meats to the public. So uh, we're, not, we're not there yet, um, but the road, the, there have been literally over the last six months, some significant steps forward towards commercialization and scalability. When we're looking at wastage, obviously consumers are trying to save money with regards to their energy and also saving around spend, but they're also trying to reduce waste and we've been tracking the appeal of restaurants using the whole of the vegetable, the whole of the fish and the whole of the animal. And you can see that they're, they're up year on year. Um, no surprise that the, most, the, the biggest growth areas come around vegetables. But where are you seeing that come to life, Charles? Yeah, thanks, Kelly. Uh, we're definitely seeing increased evidence of this on menus, and it's as part. It sits for us as part of um, loving the overlooked more broadly. I suppose, um, as you know, we do a, an awful lot of menu analysis, and over the last. Over the last three years, we've seen a steady increase in the use of things like offals, in particular, kidney, liver, bone marrow, but also uh, hearts, um, cheeks, feet, trotters, um, cod's head. Um, also, uh, more blood being called out, obviously in sausages, but also being used in sauces as well. And over the same time period, clearly as Kelly's been through, we've seen a steady increase in those consumers that find those types of applications of ingredients more appealing on menu. Also worthy of note as well, particularly in autumn, winter, we've also seen far more uh, game appear on menus as well. More pheasant, more partridge, more venison. We do, we look quite closely at how chefs describe their outlets and many more describing themselves as whole animal or whole butchery concepts. Fallow and Manteca would be really good examples of that. Also much more about the X on menu. And when I say the X, I mean X dairy cow, um, X dairy goats, um, but also uh, things like uh, sheep and ducks and chickens that are sheep and ducks when they come to the end of their lying life, at their laying life, I should say. Um, seeing those um, going back into the food system for a, a richer, uh, deeper, more defined uh, flavor. And they're finding them, all of those ingredients into product formats like burgers and charcuterie as examples. Um, the image on the uh, center there is the ex-dairy cow burger from Fallow. You'll also find things like colio uh, on some uh, menus and those are used that have been returned to pasture after their useful reproductive life, again, for a super distinctive uh, flavor. As a sign of the times, um, some chefs we've even uh, seen have started returning to the ancient practice of gleaning, which is foraging uh, in the fields. Uh, once the automated harvesting process has gone through, um, that from, a, a, I guess, an ethical and a waste perspective, but also from a raw material price perspective as well. So overall, I think we're seeing chefs increasingly value the whole, um, all parts of the animal and the vegetable, generally loving the overlooked. And this comes from the place of ethics and price uh, and cost definitely driving a renewed relevance to zero waste and waste-free cooking. That's a kind of a, a sub-level narrative that comes through when we talk to chefs. 
So we've talked a lot about um, cost reduction and what people don't want to pay for. Um, there are still some things out there that people are prepared to pay good money for. And the first one of those is local. So three quarters of people consider it important to have locally sourced ingredients on a menu or from a t or a takeaway. It just it feeds into so many things for a consumer. So there's a big emotional pull around supporting their own. Um, there's also the carbon footprint and you don't have to pay a massive premium for that like, like you once did. Um, here's some of the other um, environmental factors that we've been, we've been tracking. Um, and as you can see, as I mentioned, locally sourced has had the biggest growth from 2020 compared with the others. There hasn't been the spike in climate positive meat that we might have expected. And my personal theory on that is that people are using locally sourced as a proxy for being climate positive and it's a simple way of feeling like there hasn't been a big environmental impact preparing your meal um so the, the consumers want these things i think it's really interesting the the initiative that has just gone live with just eat and they're putting their carbon footprint traffic light system on and they're trialing that with 12 restaurants in brighton so it'll be interesting to see what type of impact that has with consumers Uh, with all of the challenges following things like COVID and Brexit, one of the things that comes through, and it really supports what Kelly was saying, comes through loud and clear when we talk to operators, is that them looking to onshore supply chains and work with local producers for key hero ingredients, the meats, the fish, uh, and the produce. Chefs tell us that they're working in partnerships with farms and farmers to forge those local supply partnerships and even growing them themselves where that is uh, possible. One of the advantages, obviously, of forging those local supply chains is the ability to perhaps pre-fund crops or varieties that they would actually want to go grow as opposed to being dictated to um, by uh, what's, what's available. Um, food is clearly all about flavour, and local is an opportunity to reduce the dwell time between catch and harvest. Um, and uh, shorter supply chains mean that reduced impact from things like transportation costs as well. And diners want to feel good about where their food, about their food choices, and drive that sort of diner emotional engagement and resonance. And that really comes, um, really comes through from knowing where your food is from and who is involved. And there's a real opportunity to continue to communicate that. Uh, and whether that's through interactive websites, sections on menus, uh, back of menus, those types of things. Again, increasingly we see that um, come through. Two really great examples uh, from restaurants. Um, top right example there, both uh, Hyde and Apricity working with businesses like Crate to Plate, um, a London-based hydroponic farm for things like lettuces, green uh, leafy vegetables uh, and herbs. And the example on the bottom right-hand side, the team uh, down at the Seahorse in Dartmouth who work incredibly hard um, to build and foster local supply chains uh, here. That fabulous looking um, Cornish turbot simply grilled over coals. So the importance of seasonal ingredients has become more important for, for diners than ever. And you can see here some of the other initiatives that we've been tracking. And this is where Charles breathes a massive sigh of relief because they're all up from where they were um, three years ago and <laughs> just checking yeah, um, yeah how, how are you seeing that manifest yeah again it's we can see that the evidence in the numbers that um, diners are very much looking for that and chefs and operators are responding to it um, I think one of the things that chefs tell us most often and it appears to be when I click the clicker. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> uh, it, chefs tell us most often uh, is that when it comes to cooking seasonally is that you get to cook with the very best ingredients that are absolutely uh, at their prime. It's something that Tom Sellers said to us. Uh, it provides a natural opportunity to allow menus to roll uh, with the season to, and to maintain their harmony uh, with nature. Um, procuring seasonally when ingredients are abundant also there's a cost benefit there as well and again that comes through as a sort of sub-level narrative when we're talking to chefs as well they talk about um, relishing the creative challenge of seasonal cooking and hyper seasonal cooking really lovely example there 
um, on the right hand side uh, is from Edit Restaurant in Hackney with their uh, January king cabbage, lentil haggis, manatee potato and leek top. But it's also an opportunity and again we see more uh, independent restaurants uh, starting to do this to create uh, local supply partnerships, yes, but also events that come off the back of that where you're really featuring um, the uh, producer. And the example on the left-hand side there is from the Wild Rabbit in Kingham. And they've got a whole program running from spring through summer, uh, autumn, uh, and into, into winter. And this is just one example that they're planning to put out in October this year to celebrate game season. That's a roast loin of Wootner's steak venison, some spiced quince, potato, black pudding, terrine, and bits of chocolate as an example there. So I think whilst consumers are looking for it, chefs relish the opportunity. So moving on to the beast that is sustainability. So there's no denying that customers are more interested and looking for this more now than they were three years ago. And we've tracked all of these different initiatives and they are all up. Um, now, of course, when it comes to sustainability, interest isn't the same as action and we can care about things, but not reflect that in our behavior every time. And ethical and sustainable behavior, let's be honest, it can come at a cost. So when with money worries, you know, they will challenge the principle of even your hardened eco warrior. So. But I think more broadly, when we look at some of those common behaviours that people are demonstrating right now, they're focusing more on food waste, they're bulking out meals with pulses at home, using energy efficient forms of cooking. They're all totally consistent with sustainable behaviour. It's just that the consumer probably isn't thinking about it through that angle. They're thinking about it more through a macro financial angle. So they'd be wrong of us to assume that sustainable behaviours won't happen in a cost of living crisis. It's more that the face of the sustainability changes. It, it's more about, for example, food waste than it is about how much plastic they've got on their packaging. And we are seeing some great examples in, in industry of how the food service sector are really putting that at the heart of what they do. Um, this is an area that chefs are really, really engaging with. Um, increasingly looking to cook and feed in harmony with nature. And this is becoming an increasingly large share, um, increasingly large share of the voice for trendsetters. Almost the buzzwords really of the last couple of years um, have become concepts in their own right. Uh, Michelin recently announced that sustainability has become a necessity. And despite all of the obvious challenges around uh, the operating environment, we continue to see a rise in concepts that put sustainability at the heart of the proposition. Places like Coombe Head, Geoffrey Robinson's New Yard, Grace and Faber, places like Darts Farm, Tom Sellers' new Dovetail, uh, as an example. One I wanted to call out, just because of the way he talked the narrative and the way he talks about it, is Dan Cox at Crockenden Farm. He talks about having a soil-centric farm with a restaurant at its heart. And all of those outlets that I talked about a few moments ago have got one thing in common, and that's driving closer links between farming and uh, agriculture and feeding. Many of them have regenerative sourcing uh, at the heart of what they're doing and as a key pillar. Um, and what we're seeing from the regenerative movement point of view is a, move, a shift from obviously based on those holistic principles, but into on-farm measurable benefits. So, which in time will allow us to be able to more accurately communicate the benefits of regenerative. Um, also, feed becomes key for animals. We've seen that being called out more, many highlighting soy free, particularly when it comes to uh, chicken and pork, and also going for slower growing uh, varieties and breeds for a more developed flavor as well. Wine consumption, fairly flat uh, across the globe, but one area that is uh, growing very fast is lower intervention in natural wines. And I've spoken to quite a few chefs who talk about when they introduce these onto the menu, it actually brings a new, together with some of the other things I've talked about, bring a new crowd uh, and a new audience into the restaurant um, altogether. So back to basics um, and doing the right thing by the planet and people, it provides a differentiated narrative for when diners want to go for that considered rarefied experience. Um, so I think 
when thinking about your own operations, it's about, as um, Kelly touched on this, it's about meeting diners where they are right now, appreciating that they're in a, uh, a place of flux where they're having to consider how and where they spend. Um, but if your proposition is built on that, absolutely stick to your principles. And we know from the, inf from the data that consumers still care um, about the impact of their choices, even if they are financially challenged just now. So in summary, a couple of key takeouts. Um, as we said right at the beginning, uh, delighting diners could not be more important than it is now. Be those moments of joy in a strained time. Be the reason to dine out. Um, we've seen comfort in Italian American and uh, modern British, but also uh, Mexican, modern Indian, modern Chinese and Japanese driving safe but global uh, indulgence. Though all of those cuisines to the right hand side, and we saw this during COVID, we've seen it during other um, uh, recessions, is that those cuisines that were on the right hand side of the chart that Kelly showed a few slides ago, will that influence will absolutely come back once people look to experiment beyond uh, comfort and nostalgia. Absolutely having a, a, a robust plant-based offer is key, but remember when eating out that meat is a treat. Avoiding wastage, leveraging that byproduct and proactively adding value to it. Consumers are having to do it so you can do it and talk about it as well. Sourcing locally for shorter supply chains that drive emotional connection with diners. Using seasonal ingredients to drive menu churn and, uh, and, uh, and innovation and the ability to cook and serve in harmony with nature. And obviously sustainability. Um, as illustrated a few slides ago, has become a necessity, but appreciate where consumers are just now, the fact that they're feeling conflicted and are having to make difficult, difficult decisions, but stick to your principles and consumers do still care. Um, we hope you found that useful and uh, thought provoking. Um, if you scan the QR code, we will um, send you the presentation to download, just pop your details in, and that will arrive in your inbox by return. So thank you very much for listening, particularly as it's the four o'clock session. Hope you've enjoyed this presentation and HRC day two. Thanks, everyone.